So my name is, uh, is Bob Fisher. I'm the uh, director of the epilepsy program at, at Stanford. And uh, my area of research interest is devices to treat epilepsy. Um, you know, drugs work in about two out of three people with epilepsy, but they don't work in everyone and they have a lot of side effects. So devices turn out to be another avenue of uh, possible treatment. And uh, we're here um, in Disneyland and uh, Fantasyland, so let's fantasize a little bit about uh, some treatments that may occur in the future. Now, prediction is difficult. You can look at some of these uh, predictions that have been made in the past and realize uh, how off base they can be. No reason anyone would want a computer in their home. The Beatles have no future in show business. Uh, horses here to stay, automobile only a novelty. No chance the iPhone's going to get market share. But I will make some predictions nonetheless um, about uh, epilepsy. Jump to the end by mistake. Talk's not that short. So I do have some disclosures to make. These are companies that make devices. I haven't made any money out of any of them, but uh, they're startups, and I should disclose them. I used to think the main problem in taking care of people with epilepsy in my clinic was um, missing medications, just not taking medicines, but I've changed my mind. I now believe that the main problem in taking care of people with epilepsy is um, bad information. Um, this is a very excellent detailed seizure diary, but most of them are not like that. Um, many seizure diaries are, are fictional. They really don't reflect the numbers of seizures or the types of seizures that people are having uh, at all. 30% um, of people don't even know when they've had a seizure because it wipes the memory. So doctors uh, such as myself are trying to treat you and trying to do research based upon uh, seizure counts, but we really don't know how many seizures you're having. We don't know what type of seizures you're having. We don't know whether it's because you're missing medications. Uh, we don't know what the trigger factors are, and we often don't know how the seizures are impacting a, a person's life. How can we invent better therapies than we have now, if that's the kind of information we have? So devices to track seizures would be extremely useful, both for patient care and for research. One of the first sets of devices that's come out, and you can get some of these uh, already today, are shake detector devices, like a watch that picks up the shaking of a seizure, Bluetooths it to uh, your cell phone, and then the cell phone automatically calls mom and dad if Johnny is having a, a seizure. It's, it's kind of... Um, imperfect and it may often go off for other things besides uh, seizures, but at least it can be a peace of mind uh, device that can detect shaking seizures in a lot of cases. And then you can go in and make sure that the person having the seizure is, is safe. Um, problem is, not all seizures involve shaking. The most common types of seizures in adults are what's called the complex partial seizures, or the new name for them is the focal impaired awareness seizure, which may just be a staring, a fumbling, an interruption. You're not going to pick that up on a, on a watch or a bed or anything that detects shaking. So we're looking for new novel ways to do detection. Um, perhaps it can be with cameras that notice that you've frozen or notice something about how your eye movements have stopped. And I uh, was amazed to find out that it's actually possible to use imaging technology these days even through a wall. This is a little bit scary. There's a professor at MIT, uh, Dina Katabi, who uses Wi-Fi, the same kind of Wi-Fi that you have in your iPhone or in your computer to image uh, people through walls, through the reflectance, and you can get human-like uh, images from it. You can even be so accurate that you can pick up breathing and pulsations of heartbeat uh, through a wall from which you can calculate with 80% accuracy a person's emotion. There is no 
privacy uh, in this uh, world anymore. But I imagine you could detect seizures anywhere in the house if this technology uh, were employed. So detecting subtle seizures is still an unsolved problem, but um, I think it's going to be solved uh, largely in the next few years by wearable seizure detectors, sensors in your clothing, eye movement monitors, the eyes tell a lot about whether a person's having a seizure, passive monitors that people don't even have to put on to wear, um, long-term EEGs, and multiple different types of method monitors, which the Epilepsy Foundation um, is encouraging development with a large grant in something called My Seizure Gauge Initiative. So I've been talking about detecting seizures, which would be useful, but what would be even more useful is predicting seizures. Uh, something that would say, uh, beep, beep, uh, you're likely to have a seizure in the next minute, take a pill, or lie down, or pull your Tesla over to the side of the road, uh, whatever. <laughs> Believe it or not, this has actually been accomplished. This is an article from the medical journal Lancet a few years ago. It's not my work, but one of my uh, colleagues. It is a bit invasive. You have to implant a recording strip um, under the bone, not into the brain, but over the brain in the approximate seizure area. And then that connects via a wire to a subcutaneous uh, device that detects uh, the EEG at all points and uh, broadcasts it to a pager on the belt. So when a seizure is uh, likely to occur, it then gives a signal to the pager. And it can't be red-green, because a lot of men are red-green colorblind, about 6%. So it uses red, blue, and white. And it looks like, it looks like this. Um, every row is a day in the life of one patient who was in this study. When you see um, red, it means the uh, computer, under this uh, guy's skin, has said a seizure is likely to occur. When you see blue, it's in the clear. When you see white, it's indeterminate. These arrows indicate when seizures actually occurred. And they're all in periods of the red. Now, there are periods of the red with no clinical seizures, but it's quite possible those were little seizures with maybe little staring spells that nobody noticed. So this is seizure prediction. How different would having epilepsy be if you knew that your next seizure was going to be two hours from now and then there wouldn't be another one for at least a several, several days. Um, this is not on the market yet. The company that developed it ran out of money and ran out of business. There are realities to all of this, uh, but I think it is going to happen uh, in the near future. Seizure prediction. It will be made even easier because there are EEGs now that don't require you to come in and lie down for an hour and have your head scraped and um, wires put on your head. There are dry wireless uh, headset uh, EEGs that are just uh, coming on the market really this, this year. And that will help monitoring a great deal. Plus the video. Monitoring from the video. You know, uh, I read, I don't know if this is true, but I read that a New Yorker is monitored by a video camera over 40 times every day he or she goes outside. There are cameras everywhere. And of course, we can intentionally put cameras in your home uh, in order to um, use computer intelligence to tell when you're having something that looks like a seizure from the video. We're not doing it now. Uh, I'm doing research on it to show that it can work, other people are. I think it will be happening within the next uh, few years. There are uh, other seizure prediction devices. There are seizure alert dogs that have been said to be accurate in some cases. I uh, think that cats can predict seizures also. They just don't bother to tell you. <laughs> why, why should they? It doesn't affect their meal. So my, my prediction is that seizure detection will be passive. You won't have to do anything, except maybe sign up for it, and it will be continuous. It will improve the sensitivity, um, how often it picks up a real seizure, and it will improve the specificity, which is cutting down the false alarms uh, from them. 
Subtle seizures will be detectable, not just the big shaking seizures, which we actually can detect now with devices. And then the uncertainty of epilepsy will be minimized. I think we'll get to this uh, possible future. Um, I, I stole this cartoon from uh, cartoonist McCracken. We're going to run a few tests to pin down the cause of your seizures. It wasn't originally about seizures, but I modified it. Um, I think there'll be a tracking device. I've represented it by a shake watch on the wrist, but I've told you there'll be many others. It will track. Um, also, there'll be um, methods to measure how much anti-epileptic drug is in your blood, maybe from your saliva but from things that won't involve you having to uh, stick yourself to get blood. That will go to an internet cloud, which will determine when you're at risk, and then it will give feedback to you and your doctor at that point to maybe take an extra pill or maybe not go on that Grand Canyon walk uh, that particular day. Half of the time we cannot tell what is causing your seizures. It's getting better as imaging gets better all the time and genetics gets better. You know, it's nature and nurture or a combination of both that causes the seizures. So nature is uh, genetics. And we've identified hundreds of genes now that either cause or predispose, predispose people uh, to epilepsy. Um, and that is uh, getting better all of the time. We've gotten much better with uh, MRIs, with identifying uh, what we call lesions. Those are structural abnormalities in brain of the type that might cause a seizure, like dysplasias, which are birth defects in the brain, or subtle non-malignant tumors, or abnormal blood vessels, or signs of past trauma, or signs of past infection. Better and better all the time at imaging these and seeing these. So um, we've also, you'll, you'll hear uh, woven throughout my talk machine intelligence, because I think machine intelligence, computers, are revolutionizing medicine. Computer uh, detection is now a better than human trained radiologist in detecting some x-ray findings, um, including some lesions in the brain that could cause epilepsy, or pneumonias, or skin cancers. All right, choosing medications and how to do it. This may frighten you a little bit when I tell you how much we doctors are guessing on these. Uh, in the United States, we currently have 26 choices for an epilepsy drug. How do we pick them? I mean, in some cases, it can be kind of obvious by the side effects, like if a person is very fat, you don't want to give them valproic acid, which causes weight gain. If they're very skinny, you probably don't want to give them topiramate, or zonisamide, Topamax or Zonagran, which causes weight loss. I just picked that as an example. But most of the time we don't know, and we're guessing what the best drug would be. So again, artificial intelligence, computer intelligence, machine learning it's called. Can we take a bunch of information about you, your genes? When I say take, I mean you sign up for a study. This is not. This is not something we're seizing from you uh, without your awareness. Um, your genes, your body physique, your gut bacteria, which turn out to influence the brain more than we ever thought uh, we knew before, your toxic exposure history, your medical history in response to prior medicines. Uh, I'm doing a study of all of these factors fed into a computer and to see if the computer can spit out what is the next best drug for you. Is it Tegretol? Is it Vimpat? Is it Clonopin? What is it? What's the best drug for you to reduce the trial and error? All right, let's uh, talk about another technology, which is drug delivery to the brain. I'm jumping around here because my charge is just to kind of make you aware of some of the devices and technologies that are potentially around the corner that may be an alternative to medicines. So this actually isn't an alternative to medicine, but this is a merging between a device and a medicine by squirting a drug directly into the brain where it's needed. There was an old physician that pointed out the only difference between a drug and a poison is dose. And with the exception of maybe chemotherapy agents against cancer, that is nowhere uh, as true as it is in the epilepsy world. Um, the epilepsy drugs have a lot of side effects. 
dizziness, blurry vision, unsteadiness, fatigue, particularly mental fogging, mood side effects, because they are causing brain cells to fire in a different pattern. That may be good to stop seizures, but it may be bad for things that the brain does uh, all the time in its everyday work. Uh, and, and what sense does it make that we give a drug for epilepsy that causes kidney stones or damages your liver? It would be better just to put the drug where it's needed and not where it might cause side effects. So that has been something that I have uh, been working on for years, decades actually as well, to deliver medicine where it's needed, near the seizure focus in brain, or in the fluid bathing the brain, which is called the ventricles. Um, continuous feed from a reservoir and a pump, which is typically implanted in the abdomen and connected all under the skin with a catheter that goes into, into the brain. And then this is continually squirting seizure medicine into the fluids of the brain. And it needs refilling when it runs dry about every two months or so by injecting sterilely uh, through a diaphragm in this hockey puck of a uh, reservoir and pump. So this is now uh, gone, uh, by the way, this technology is used uh, for treating cancers or infections in the brain. It's never been used previously for epilepsy. But uh, we've uh, initiated a trial in Australia and uh, the initial results are really quite promising. Um, paper on it has just been written up and submitted. The abstract uh, on it was presented last December at the American Epilepsy Meetings. And it's possible to get very high concentrations of a seizure drug in the brain, much higher than you can get with a pill, but with fewer side effects because the drug is much more localized. So I'm hopeful about this. It's not going to be for everyone. You're not going to have pumps and tubes put in your brain if you have one seizure a year. But for people who have uncontrolled seizures where nothing else is working, this may turn out to be a completely new uh, line of treatment. Now here's something that's a, a little bit technical, but I'm excited about it because it's just been developed recently and, and we just got a uh, NIH grant to move it from the laboratory to humans. The notion is you take a drug that has a big effect on the brain, like would stop seizures in a big way, say propofol, which is an anesthetic. This is one of the things if you have a colonoscopy or a tooth pulled or something, you're probably going to get either Versed or propofol to put you to sleep for a few minutes. So you coat it with a polymer that makes the molecule inactive. You inject it into a vein. It circulates everywhere, including the brain. But it does nothing because it's coated with a polymer. But now what you do is you take an ultrasound machine, which can have a very focused beam, and you shine it on a part of the brain where you want that drug to work, like let's say a seizure focus that you're thinking of taking out. And the ultrasound beam cracks the polymer, and the drug comes out of the capsule and instantly goes into brain and shuts that piece of brain off for as long as the ultrasound is on. When you stop the ultrasound, drug effect goes away. Brain gets back to normal. So I'm pretty enthusiastic about this as a way of mapping brain and also safety. If you're going to have seizure surgery and you want to make sure that the area around where you're going is safe, you can put it to sleep for a few minutes like this and see how the person does. It's called a caged, C-A-G-E-D, drug. So I predict that you're going to have personally targeted medicines in the future. There'll be inhaled drugs. Uh, that just came out, a good nasal inhaled uh, midazolam, which is a drug like lorazepam, Ativan. Um, I think pharmacies will have it soon. Um, cerebrospinal fluid and brain infusion for severe epilepsy. I just talked about that. Focused ultrasound, blood-brain disruption method, and I didn't talk but immune uh, targeting. And the result will be a vastly improved therapeutic to toxic ratio of medications. Surgery is uh, being revolutionized uh, for epilepsy. It's no longer so much cut and suction. It's now um, focused x-rays, focused ultrasound, or robot-assisted uh, surgery. And I won't talk about that too much unless you have questions about it, but the operations that we're doing 
Um, the most common operation for epilepsy is a temporal lobectomy because the hippocampus and the temporal lobes here are the most seizure prone parts of the brain. We used to have to open the skull, go in and with a suction, suction out the seizure area. Uh, now more often than not, pencil point hole in the back of the head, laser fiber in, under MRI, watching it as we do it to make sure we're in the right place, heat up the laser tip and pull it back and we're done. The person's home the next day, only because we're afraid to send them home the same day, but we probably could. Works just about as well. Okay, so the final uh, thing I'm going to talk about um, in terms of new technology is neuromodulation, which is also called neurostimulation. This is where you use electricity to counteract seizures. Kind of makes sense because seizures are basically an electrical storm in the brain. There are three flavors of neurostimulation that are currently approved. Uh, one with which we have the most experience, been around for, for well over 10 years, is a vagus nerve uh, stimulation where you, you put a stimulator in the chest, under the skin. These, these all have to be completely under the skin or they get infected. Everything's subcutaneous. Um, and a wire goes to the vagus nerve usually almost always on the left side of the neck. It feeds activity into the brain in a way that makes it much harder for the brain to have a seizure. Um, it's safe, it's well tolerated. Uh, you may feel some throat or voice changes when the stimulation comes on, but uh, people usually get quite used to those. Um, effect builds up slowly over months to a couple of years, and by then seizures are usually on the average cut in half but even the ones that happen are often not as strong, as long, or have as much of a troublesome aftermath uh, as the ones that did before. That's vagus nerve uh, stimulation. Then there's uh, two other kinds of stimulation that actually involve putting the wires not on a nerve heading into the brain, but into the brain itself. Responsive neurostimulation, RNS, and deep brain stimulation, DBS. Again, all three of these are here. Your doctor could schedule you for any of these uh, right now if uh, it was suitable for your particular situation. FDA approved, covered by insurance. This is the result of a, a clinical trial, one that, that I ran, um, on deep brain stimulation where wires were put into a pacemaker area of the brain called the thalamus and allowed to uh, automatically on a clock cycle stimulate for one minute on and five minutes off because that saves the battery life and the one minute lasts longer than five minutes in effect. So you don't have to stimulate continuously. And down is better, fewer seizures compared to the baseline. And green is with five volts of stimulation and red is a placebo treatment with zero volts of stimulation. So you see that the stimulation is better at this point, everybody is turned on to active stimulation after three months. And look how the seizure frequency goes down. So that by four or five years, the number of seizures on the average is only one third of the baseline. And about 15% of people become seizure free for at least six months or more, which is pretty good because they were having an average of 20 seizures a month at the start of the trial. So here's something that's even perhaps more interesting, uh, and that's, uh, oh, I say I've left the slide out, so let me just tell you about it. Responsive neurostimulation, you can probably see the picture a little bit, small picture, here. Instead of implanting in the chest, a stimulator device is implanted in the head, but this device also records. It's actually a miniature EEG machine that gets implanted in the skull covered up with the skin. It's continually recording a seizure. I'm sorry, it's continually recording the EEG. And when a seizure occurs, it detects it. It can't predict, but it can detect pretty quickly. And then gives a counter shock to stop the seizure. It's like an automatic defibrillator for the heart, but it's in the brain and it's for a seizure. It probably does more than just detect and stop a seizure. It also probably chronically changes the electrical activity of the brain in a beneficial way. But the statistics on it and the improvement 
are almost identical to the slide that I showed you before for the deep brain stimulation. Um, a, for, for all three of these, vagus nerve stimulation, deep brain stimulation, responsive neurostimulation, um, there have been clinical trials with placebos, patient not knowing which arm they were in, um, doctors not knowing who evaluated them, that showed statistical benefit enough to convince the FDA to let it be brought on market. I mention that because there are a lot of crackpot therapies uh, out there that you don't necessarily want to go for. So these three um, help. They're not cures. And they do require surgery. So someday soon, I hope, we'll have ways of non-invasively stimulating the brain through magnetic coils outside the head. It's called TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, or direct current, just with really 9-volt batteries. This is tremendously simple, attached to moist gauze pads on the head. Don't try this at home. I mean, do this even though it's just a battery. Do it in conjunction with doctors who know what they're, they're doing. So the last thing I wanted to touch on is not really a device. I just want to mention um, a, a teaching point that I, I work hard to teach my students. And that's that the most important thing about taking care of someone with epilepsy is not stopping their seizures. It's improving the quality of life. So if I put somebody on a drug that stops their seizures but makes them depressed and tired, I've made them worse, not better. So we are going to need in the future better ways to judge these comorbidities. Depression, anxiety, tension deficit disorder, thought disorders, to address the stigma and the social relation problems of epilepsy, the work school limits, independence, driving living, and relationships. We need better instruments and markers to recognize comorbidities, to understand biological links between epilepsy and psychiatric symptoms, successful social programs to reduce stigma. And by the way, uh, driving is one of the biggest deals in my clinic. And I'm pretty convinced that self-driving cars are going to change the lives of people with uh, epilepsy when it comes. I, I, I'm up there at Stanford, you know, right next to Google, that is Waymo, which is the, the biggest uh, dealer of self-driving cars. And together with someone from the Epilepsy Foundation, I made a pitch to do a pilot trial of driving people with epilepsy to their clinic appointments because, you know, they can't drive. It's hard for them to get there. Um, they said no, and I sort of said, well, why did you invite us here then? And it turns out they, they wanted me to tell them how their cameras, because there are two of them in the self-driving cars pointed to the driver, could tell when the driver was having a seizure so the car could drive them to a hospital. It actually wasn't a bad idea. It wasn't what I was coming in to talk about, but it wasn't a bad idea. So I've talked to you about some of the fantasies for the uh, future, and I just hope that, that the items that I talk to you about won't appear on somebody else's version of this slide 20 years from now. These are old remedies for epilepsy. Wear a shirt in which some person has died, or maybe smelled like they died. Um, three drops of blood from the third rib of a maddened black cat. These are all old rep, uh, remedies for uh, epilepsy. Uh, and you can judge yourself whether you think uh, my uh, remedies will appear on that slide. That's all I have. Thank you. I'm ahead of time. I prefer to go short than long. While I was sitting there during that excellent talk on the ketogenic diet, I cut out about a third of my slides. Any, uh, any questions or comments or experiences? Yes. The question is, uh, does the electrode require to know exactly where the seizures come from? For the responsive neurostimulation, it does, although it has two electrodes. So you, you, you get two guesses, or you can have two seizure areas, the most common of which would be both intertemporal lobes. For the uh, vagus nerve stimulator and for the deep brain stimulator, you do not need to know where the seizures come from, and that's an advantage of them. Um, although the uh, RNS has the advantage of 
recording the seizures, and the other two do not record the seizures. So when they record the seizures, it becomes a long-term monitor, and it might actually tell you, oh, I thought these seizures were coming from all over, but I've now recorded for six months, and 95% of them are coming from here. Let's laser that son of a gun out and see if we can actually cure the epilepsy. Other questions? Yes? The drug prescription? Oh, okay. Well, that's actually that's actually my research project. It's uh, funded, um, and um, what we're doing now is uh, building the machine intelligence model to do the prediction. Then we'll go into a second stage where we actually do predict uh, what drug would be best and have the patient take that medication and see how it works. So if stage two is successful, then yes, we can do that. I mean, it's got to be a little demoralizing to you to hear a physician in the business such as myself saying a lot of the time um, the doctor is guessing and you are gambling with the next drug, drug choice, but that is the truth. Any other questions? All right. You've been a great audience. Thanks for coming. <laughs>